Good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome to another Scotney takeover of Wild Ginger Running. We are at a later time tonight because of, uh, well, our guest requested that we maybe did a little bit of a yeah, later time. Yeah, he needed some, so he some did... more time to get his tea in or something like that. Tea? Or that... I mean, like cups of tea. Oh, cups of tea, yeah, because this person is well known for their, for their cups of tea. But how are we doing, Jen? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> the, the customary uh, asking that question. <laughs> No. Same old, You've same seen old. me today. I have seen you today, <laughs> indeed. But just for our listeners out there and those who are joining us live on YouTube, if you are joining us live on YouTube, thanks for coming along. And uh, please, you can ask our wonderful guest some questions. And who is our guest this evening, Jen? Oh, I don't know. Some guy called Damien Hall. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do we know him? Good evening, Damien. <laughs> Hi. He sounds rubbish. I wouldn't have him on. <laughs> yes. Get a proper guest. John Kelly, something like that. <laughs> yeah. How are we doing? Yeah, good, thanks. That was very professional, Marcus. That was very good. Actually, uh, I thought, we haven't show, actually I really it's... introduced you at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is ultra running, international ultra runner, fifth at UTMB, did winner mention... of numerous races. I did write your bio to put on the <laughs> proper <laughs> podcast. <laughs> notes um and podium at some of the toughest races as well dragon's back spine race is it one race called utmb isn't there i, think? I mentioned that first. oh you mentioned that one as well but also you seem i was fifth i was fifth there. I, um a little um fascination with breaking records as well are we calling them records or fkts tonight i feel like Stu smith will keep badgering me if i call them fkts all night so i'm going with records but you're welcome to use the fkt <laughs> um and to talk to us about your new book um in it for the long run which mm. yeah so congratulations on that oh thanks uh, that's also rubbish i wouldn't i wouldn't buy that <laughs> Steal it. You're meant, you're meant to be selling i'm it. sure you're contractually ob obliged to um, tell us how wonderful it is it's a it's terrible. It's honestly, it, uh, no, it's, well, hopefully it's okay in places, but yeah, it was a bit like an ultra marathon. Started out quite well, maybe a bit too pacey. Wheels fell off towards the end and then just stumbled over the line. Uh, just about made the, the third deadline after a few all-nighters. Uh, lots of bad, bad nutrition mistakes. And um, how would you describe, like, what book did you set out to write? Because it's quite a, it's not just about your ultra running or your records it's also a little bit of history about the sport and also some some other issues such as environmental issues and things like that weave into it oh you've actually read it uh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> one of us um, has yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of it marcus <laughs> um yeah i, I marcus I skim ran to where he was mentioned but yes i have read it I so was say, you, uh, you, you should, was that the book that you set out to write or did you, you not really uh, have a You shouldn't tell him what I said about him then. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, it did change a little bit. Um, they First of all, it was Kirsty Reed at uh, Vertebrate. It was her idea. Um, and she wanted, I suppose, sort of my insight into, into record slash FKT bothering. Um, but over time, that I suppose it turned into a bit more of an autobiographical thing which I was a bit nervous about, but that's just kind of what came out. Uh, but then I've always been very interested in, I love the pedestrianisation, you know, the, sorry, pedestrianisation of Norwich City Centre in joke for Alan Park fans there. Um, I didn't know that was something you were so so keen on. I think I it? missed that chapter in the book, yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Are you now moving on to, like, kind of bits of Bristol, the kind of just nail Norwich. section? and that. Just uh, The pedestrianism era <laughs> in, the, in the late 1800s, which was... Um, yeah, uh, fascinating, uh, incredible, wacky, uh, screw loose uh, era uh, and that isn't celebrated enough, I think. I honestly think there's some great films in it, you know, Captain Barclay and people like that and people running from Paris to Moscow. And then did they because actually the stats don't don't quite line up. And, you know, just a fascinating era, which was actually quite short uh, and ruined by the bicycle. Yeah, um, yes, that came in. And then damn that penny farthing. Yes. <laughs> um, but it was an incredible era. And actually that, well, records and FKTs actually started long, long before that. In fact, the birth of the marathon, of course, was a sort of, not an FKT attempt, but a long journey that wasn't a race, um, you know, a messenger traveling a long way on, on foot. Um, so I don't know, the, the history stuff just came up as I was going. 
And I just really enjoyed researching that. Uh, so I chucked a bit of that in as well, I suppose. But yeah, it always ends up a bit different. And then I tried to be as honest as I could. Of course, a few things get taken. Uh, it's smarter to leave out. But yeah, I tried to be quite honest. Um, Ooh, that, that, sounds <laughs> that sounds slightly controversial, eh? a bit like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Probably if I left them out, I should probably not say them publicly. I can't think of anything too dramatic, actually. Just one or two tiny things that actually, I don't know, maybe someone was having a bad day and, and actually putting it in a book isn't very kind. Or maybe I was having a bad day, more to the point, um, like today. Um, but yeah, it changed a bit to answer your question. But hopefully it's still, I don't know, hopefully it's still worth reading. But uh, who knows? And how who would knows? you describe it now if somebody asked what your book was about? Load of nonsense. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it's my load of bobbins. Um, I suppose it's my my mostly my journey into ultra marathon running, and I guess one of the themes is try, you, uh, almost that debate a bit about not what's better races or, or solo challenges, but what are the differences? Because uh, of course we can all do both, but like what are the big differences between them? Um, and and what what do the, what what does one give you that the other one doesn't and that sort of thing, I suppose. Um, yeah, I don't know if that sounds like a good summary or not. <laughs> <laughs> You've read it. You you haven't. <laughs> you need to take over the PR for this well, one. Well, well, <laughs> yes, probably. Um, Trond, uh, who's joined us live on, on YouTube, so he's just just read it and it's an excellent book. Oh, there we go. That's all so we need to say. <laughs> we'll, we'll maybe get Trond on. He can maybe give us a bit more of a. You could- if you could just ask him instead, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hannah Basley's still waiting for her copy. Um, so, yeah, can you chase up where that's gone, please? Yeah, but she's got to do the kids' bedtime shortly. So um, I think she maybe wants us to hurry up. Oh, <laughs> she says she'll catch up on a recording later on. So she'll, she'll, uh, um, when she's read it. Yeah, uh, yeah, most of that's not good bedtime sort of story, a children's story, bedtime reading oh. necessarily, I don't think. Are you, they're dreaming especially... about toenails falling off and hallucinations and things like that yeah maybe it's not yeah maybe it is i don't know uh, probably it's, probably it's not, not. soporific enough would it kind of you know just... <laughs> <laughs> when you put it like that it probably is quite good bedtime, if you pick your chapters yeah. maybe <laughs> um uh, uh, we're getting some questions coming in on youtube so if you are joining us live on YouTube and you want to ask Damien some questions about either his book or about ultra running or any of the crazy stuff he's been up to. Um, Vicky Royale wants to um, kind of know whose birthday it is. She's obviously like really looking closely at the screen. Oh, I can see something in the background that says day. Oh, blimey. Um, so um, I oh, spy yes, bonding in mine. the background. This is it the... was, my daughter's, was my daughter's birthday yesterday. Uh, she said... She turned 10, so I've been a parent for 10 years, which is quite frightening, but probably not as long as you, Marcus, I don't think. 16. Uh, I can trump you on, so I have a 16-year-old wow. my hands, so, yeah. <laughs> You're practically a granddad. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. <That's... laughs> you, I'm going to swing this back to the book. So, you, when your children oh, yeah, don't sorry. come across as being that impressed by your running <laughs> in the book, <laughs> is that, are they still not is, really that like, fussed like, about it? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> No, they're not very interested. No, because I, I, um, yeah, no, they're not really, not really all that Im- impressed or interested. Um, um, yeah, I don't know where to. I mean, you don't want to go on about it too much, hopefully, because I don't know if you, you know, it's natural for kids, I think, to rebel a bit against their parents, and I'm probably an even more natural person to rebel against, just because I'm quite annoying and and boring, uh, as we've already alluded to. Uh, I don't know, Marcus. What do your what do your kids? You know, what are their reactions to your running? <laughs> hey, we're interviewing you, not <laughs> <laughs> not me tonight. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm bored afraid. of me. I, just I make myself out so like an amazing so... <laughs> parent, distant parent. They only see me a couple of times a week, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm uber super cool, Dad. Um, because they can get oh, away murder. Trick? They do just but... kind of expect you to win stuff. Though. Yeah, <laughs> like when I went to do like the Howard Hobble when they were staying, which is like quite a short race, like thirty mile one with some good fell runners, and I'm kind of mid mid pack in that. And then I like, first answer, like the first question, I mean, was just so where did you finish? <laughs> it doesn't always work out like that. That's your dad. <laughs> so they do, yeah. They have, uh, yeah. <laughs> not interested. Thirty yeah. in something. I don't know. <laughs> 
I, I remember reading a quite a good thing online comparing just like team sports to, to being a runner because at least in team sports, I don't know, maybe you win half the time or even a third of the time. You can come over and say, we won today, kids. We won our game. And in running, I mean, Marcus Marcus wins a lot. I don't actually win many races. But but yeah, the chances of winning aren't all that high for most people. But yeah, even in our household, even then they're not impressed, really. Just not very interested. You quite yeah. often get a medal even though you don't win in running, which is quite good though. <laughs> That is true. And Which I, I think taken... can impress kids. <laughs> yes. Actually, my daughter for quite a long time, I'm not someone who hangs on medals up, but I've, I've got them in a shoebox or, well, two shoeboxes, um, down somewhere. And she did for a while when she was younger. I think they were all wins. Um, <laughs> I, so that I was, a good, that was the best moment. Yeah. But, aren't they, in, but aren't they inspired or impressed by the commitment that you have to ultra running and the training or do they kind of... You know, do they see that as your as your job now as well, or do they just see that something like Daddy does and he's off for another run? And we miss him. <laughs> I think they've gone beyond the stage where they miss me now. To be honest, uh, I just think they, yeah, no, I don't think maybe maybe quietly, hopefully they are, but no, there's not any kind of oh, how was your run, Daddy, or like no, I'm just away for three days and I come back and, you know, they don't ask about it. Uh, they wonder if I bought them back a present. So I stopped bringing them back presents because I thought it was associated, you know, they'd look forward to me going away. Um, <laughs> they don't seem particularly impressed. But that, honestly, that kind of, I think it kind of spurs me on a bit, you know, in the dark, the dark long nights uh, when you're when you're running running through the night. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it does spur me on a bit. But yeah, no, they're, they're not, they're not in, impressed or... Uh, or anything really. And in terms of all the the um, races and records that you go through in this book, which one are you most proud of? Uh, um, yeah, probably the Pennine Way. Probably. Well, hopefully, like yeah. I was just thinking. I guess there are going to be some more attempts on it on it soon. Uh, there'll be several this are year. They? I <laughs> Oh, I don't need to yet. Um, <laughs> no, I've heard of, well, three three men's possibly attempts, um, but yeah, no, probably that one. Uh, it did feel like a sort of even almost a nine year uh, journey since I first walked it, uh, and like probably four years since I start seriously started thinking of it. So probably that one. I love um, the um the quote. I hadn't realised that, but in your guidebook that you'd written about the Pennine Way, hadn't you written about Mike Hartley's record and saying about how nobody would ever beat it? I mean, at that time, I'm guessing yeah. I had no idea that you would go on to beat that. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't even. I'm pretty sure I didn't ha have an idea of what ultra running was, or, or long distance fell running, or whatever we want to call it. Um, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I didn't know what that sport was, and but I remember researching. I was reading the other guidebooks and the previous guidebook from from Oran Press, uh, and thinking, oh my goodness, like you know, who does that? Like I didn't know anyone who did that sort of thing. And I remember putting it in the book, just thinking, that's he's an alien, you know, he's just. <laughs> but then I suppose when you look back, you see there are several seeds planted, I suppose, in your mind, and and that would have been one of them. Um, you know, it took a long time for that to percolate round to think maybe I could try that, but yeah. Yeah, it was very, um, yeah, incredible to read about that. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's inspiring, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? and talking about your kids kind of keeping you you grounded, we are getting some questions on, on YouTube, and, and Tom Bollins, I think, is kind of um, just wants you to keep you grounded oh, yeah, in, in some what? respects. This is, <laughs> this is Tom Bollins asking, I'm, gonna, I'm posting it on, I don't know why the, the fonts can uh, well, I'll read dark. it out. Which FKT were you more gutted to lose? Southwest Postal Path or Paddy Buckley? <laughs> Is that spelled Tom Bollen? Bollen, yeah, yeah. B-O-L-L-E-N. Yeah. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Tom's a school friend. Uh, How is he? Uh, so he's coming to heck with you. Excellent. Oh, you well, you. kids and school friends are there to keep you grounded. <laughs> My school friends, yeah, just take the mickey out of me constantly still. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the Paddy Buckley round, I was very surprised to get that in the first place and then always just thought someone would take it a week later. Uh, so I think I had it over a year. That was quite, that was just a, yeah, bit of disbelief really because it was, you know, proper fell running uh, and one of the big three rounds. Um, I, but uh, yeah, you still don't like, you still don't enjoy handing a record <laughs> over. But um, but the Southwest Coast Path, I suppose, I got more used to that one. It was my first sort of decent, decent one. Uh 
And yeah, I got used to it. Maybe I'd got too used to it. You know, it was a good four years or so, you know, not quite the 31 years that Mike Hartley enjoys. But um, yeah, and I, I got used to seeing one or two people go for it and kind of not get all that close and kind of, you know, it just relaxes you and you, you think, ah, yeah, that's my record. Yeah, you can't have that. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then someone breaks it, which is a bit annoying. Um, so yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And if you've got any more interesting kind of yeah, questions, any, Tom, any, or anything else you want to any, tell, sort of cancel him or delete him or something, or <laughs> mute him, anything that we're always always welcome. Um, talking about the spine, um, yeah, because you've you've done how many times have you done this the spine race? Uh, just two, just two, just just two, two just two. <laughs> just two. Um, John uh, Zink is kind of asking for a bit of a kind of a top training tip and a piece of gear for the spine. So two, two kind of bits there to that question. So your top training tip for the spine and your kind of top piece of kit other than tea bags. Um, <laughs> and he does say the spine rather than the Pennine Way. So I don't think Jay-Z is going for the Pennine Way record just yet. <laughs> I know you that. Oh, okay, phew, because I, yeah, I give him duff advice there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, training advice. I would actually say, uh, I think it's quite natural to think, right, I've got to do lots of long runs with a big heavy pack. I would actually say, you know, spend quite a lot of time doing doing, doing the opposite of that and, and work on, work. don't forget to work on your speed and, you know, get your economy up nicely so that you can, you know, travel at a decent speed. I think I sense a lot of people, you know, start doing the, the long, slow stuff a bit too soon maybe and, and load up the pack and, and that's going to kind of, it will bring you a bit of strength, but it's going to kind of slow you down. Uh, and I would save that till, you know, quite near the event, really. Um, yeah, don't forget to get fast and strong as well. Like, you know, I would do a bit of weight training because the, the terrain is pretty grueling and quite mixed and, you know, boggy and so on. Uh, in terms of kit, um, I'll try not to do something obvious like plug innovate. Um, <laughs> it's uh, all right. We're, we're loaded up with Montaigne tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, few instances you do want to go with something really light because they really load you up with kit on that race and uh, I think we've had good discussions online haven't we about who got the lightest spork uh, <laughs> what did we get down to was it like five or six grams or I think, uh, I think we ended up with just like a plastic free one from the services right, or something was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> decided that was, like was, it, was about, it was about three or four grams it was <laughs> but I mean I think it would probably just dissolved in a hot cup of tea or something it was, you know, <laughs> it was, it was more for show it was like <laughs> yeah but you had the lightest fork so you know who's the weird, real winner um yeah i mean i the stuff that you're not really going to use the sleeping bags and so on yeah i i would if you could afford it get get the lightest possible um but yeah when it comes to a waterproof jacket yeah you do want a proper one don't go with a lightweight one there um that'd be my advice get a yeah proper waterproof jacket you're gonna be wearing it the whole time um probably sleeping in it too so yeah get a proper one cool brilliant great advice there on that one we're getting quite a few questions coming in we're Which getting one? loads so i don't think we, we, we need to ask thing, you exactly. so yeah. to, tom's back now <laughs> <laughs> who are we going for should we go should we stick to the fkt yeah i think while well, we're talking about the FKT, fkt or records 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 um because you have i think we've not even mentioned the kate raff one that you did either have we yet but um GB is asked, which FKT do you have your eye on next? And which aspect of training for an FKT do you find the toughest? Well, yeah, I do have a little scheme in mind coming up quite, quite soon, actually, this later this month. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll keep the, keep the details to myself, although you two are grinning knowingly. Um, <laughs> similar, it is in the north of England. It's a similar type of record, I suppose, is the best thing You're to not say. going for the limestone way, are you? <laughs> I've only had oh, it like I've, heard that's really, I've only heard that's a really soft record. I might, I might <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, I've got one coming up. I've got, yeah, I've kind of got F, FKT fever still. Um, I love, even though races are beginning to come back on. Yeah, they're just, they're just really exciting. They're great fun. And, Did you think uh, you'd be um, planning these even if, uh, even, uh, or was it the, the races that you had planned this year aren't looking like they're going ahead? Yeah, I think I, I think by the end of maybe mid or middle of last year, I thought I'm going to do from now on. I'm going to do slightly fewer races and slightly more sort of record FKT attempts or just solo solo projects or whatever you want to call them. Um, 
they just I don't know you can do it totally on your own terms I suppose you, you know you pick where and when and, and the style whether you're being supported or not and um whether you want to go for you know a soft a soft record like like Marcus's or or you know a proper one no uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jess Marcus Marcus is faster than me I, I I wouldn't stand a chance um yeah no I really I really I really enjoy them um and then also yeah you can do them totally solo and get that real satisfaction like my winter paddy of, of having done it all yourself which is really satisfying but also it's great sometimes to sort of bring your mates in and 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 have a team thing where you really feel like yeah it's when running is you know it's a solo sport really but you can really make it feel like a team event which is really quite cool as well um so i like that aspect but yeah i'd like to race race again at some point this year but um i forgot what the question was but yeah and the second part of the question that. which was which aspect of training um oh. fkt do you find the toughest or do you find it tough at all or do you just enjoy that kind of having that goal yeah i don't know if well, it's probably always like if I was given a, my favorite type of run would be a lot, you know, a long run, uh, a, a, a bimble, as some people call them. Um, <laughs> you don't. You call them that. <laughs> just me, actually. Yeah, no one else. Um, <laughs> um, it's probably the speed work, to be honest. I'm, I'm a bit I'm a bit reluctant with that stuff. I'm not a runner who I don't love that so much of, of going going fast. I like, yeah, I like four, you know, four, six, eight hours out in in lumps. That's that's the most fun thing for me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but you know, when you do intervals, you nearly always feel fantastic afterwards and really relieved and, and satisfied that you have. But it's probably that. It's probably that. I think one thing, and I, I'm going to just show off that I've read your book now. <laughs> one thing I was surprised at in the book was that you seemed to, uh, you had the work of a psychologist helping you before the Pennine Way one. Whereas I would have thought that that would have been more... Um, needed for a race situation actually rather than for an FKT so it was a was there a reason that you picked that time to work with a psychologist or and what was it that you were focusing on in terms of the FKT for that yeah maybe it was um I just I was just sort of maybe we just had or I had a bit more time because of lockdown and, and, and stuff I just felt like I had time to really I guess prepare properly prepare as fully as possible I had less like a lot of people, I'd less travel, less trips away. And I just thought, what, you know, what are the aspects I haven't, where are my weak points? What are the aspects I haven't worked on before? Um, and although I've every, I've always sort of finished a race or finished a challenge, you know, not always as well as I would have hoped, but I just thought maybe there are some tricks. Maybe, you know, I, I should look into this. So I had, yeah, three sessions with, with Dr. Josie Perry that were really helpful. Um, I was, you know, if I, if I'm to be frank, you know, I was, it was, you know, I'm intimidated by John Kelly, if I'm honest, and my and Mike Hartley because I see them as incredible athletes, and I don't see myself on their level. Um, and so, I, anybody that doesn't know, like you and John Kelly shared a coach, and were going for the Pennine Way record within. Well, I mean, at one point it was was it going to be on the same day, but it ended up being was it ten days apart? I think it was. He had the record for eight day, yeah, for eight days. So it was, yeah, it was close. Um, yeah, yeah, we got this. We've got the same coach, David Roach, uh, the American. So I did think, well, you know, physically, um, you know, we might not be all that different. So it might not be that aspect of it. So I did think it's going to be logistics. Like I've got to get the right team and, and just plan things as thoroughly as possible, be as efficient as possible. Um, and then I also, yeah, I, I guess I wasn't thinking what's he not doing, but I thought, well, I've never really talked to a sports psychologist. Um, and, and she encouraged me. I think it was helpful. She encouraged me, I suppose, to try and bring uh i suppose kind of my values into it and try and bring a message into it so I, I suppose i was you know i was trying to bring more of an environmental sort of theme to it although got to hold my hands up and you know several quite a few car journeys happened that wouldn't have happened otherwise um but you know overall i sort of offset that although that's a that's a separate debate but but yeah brought all those you know she said bring those values in make them visible you know what's going to motivate you what's your why make it visible you know write it down write it on the van uh, I don't think she said write it on your arm, but I did. Um, <laughs> that was the whole uh, speculation for the the time you were running of what your FFF meant, wasn't it? Yes, I think the best. It was quite fun hearing different guesses, and obviously, yeah, the best guess was it was yeah, yeah, a repeated a repeated swear word, which is. <laughs> um, um, but that was yeah, that was a bit of fun. Um, but yeah, so she helped me. She helped me there. Um, I think just set up my motivation. Think about my why. Um, yeah, I think it was useful. I think it was useful. Is that something that you've been able to pass on to the athletes that you coach? 
Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, and there are certain things, some other, um, I mean, it's worth going to her website. I think it's Performance in Mind, or if you just search for Josie Perry, yeah. there's some good sort of worksheets on her website. Um, and one of them is, for example, well, you can do like a confidence booster uh just beforehand which I, I did do i'll be honest uh i think that was helpful and there's something called like a what if sheet which i think is another good tactic where you kind of think well what am i worried about what, what is most likely to go wrong and then you write that down and then you kind of write some things to try and prevent it and then you write some things of how you're going to respond um and yeah that does several things it hopefully makes you less likely to do that thing um but also some practical solutions are ready and you've got them prepared but also yeah, mentally, so you don't kind of fall apart. If you just the the obvious one is kind of uh, going off course, for example, like uh, like me and Marcus have been in a race together where we've both got off course. So we, I, I we both know that we're both quite good at doing that. Um, I mean, you managed to but, do that in a spine race despite being the author of oh. the guidebook to the Pennine Way, which wasn't your finest moment. <laughs> yes, thanks for bringing that up. You really have the book, haven't you? We're gonna quick, um, let's quickly put Mozart to one side. Let's, <laughs> Let's brush that very quickly. Before you ones. bring up the dad dancing, thank you. Um, oh, we've got a video yes. of that coming up. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. I'm going to regret this whole thing, aren't I? Um, we have too many photos of you. <laughs> yeah, disappointed in, it? Yeah. in the book. The dad dancing does. Yeah. Oh, just... oh, not the photos, but it was mentioned, the dad dancing on the stage. <laughs> it was mentioned. It was mentioned. Um, yeah, I got pretty badly lost on that first spine race. In mitigation, I was uh, very, very tired. And I've never done anything like that before. And it was very, very dark and cold. And I got very confused by some hallucinations. Um, yeah. Right. We've got more questions coming in as well, haven't we? I was going to... Um, we, well, we can come back to the Pennine Way in, in, a, in a wee bit, can't we, really? We can kind of weave our way around to that. We can do whatever that. we want. We can. <laughs> Uh, that's for Joyce being in charge of this interview. Um, talk, keep in mind, so we've talked a little bit about the training um, for an FKT um, and for the Pennine Way. And we've also been, so you're also another well known race you've done really well in is, is a UTMB. Oh, race. He, doesn't, he doesn't like to mention that. Does it? Well, we'll, we'll bring that up. Um, and and uh, Nicola, Nicola has said, What's the most important aspect in the training when it comes to UTMB? logging the miles or the elevation are we going what are we going for <laughs> well I, I would again approach it with with you know work on your economy do do some proper speed work for a good spell beforehand you know you want to get um into your well you, yeah optimize your your economy which is i suppose essentially making your your easy pace faster is one way to understand it um so i would work on that and then and then yeah, maybe six weeks, eight weeks out. Um, and maybe, you know, you two are coaches as well. Maybe you'd do it differently. But but th then you'd start thinking about about elevation and, and really what you're doing there is. And those those adaptations apparently come a lot sort of quicker. Um, so it's your muscular adaptations uh, more so. And, yeah, I would practice power hiking up steep things, uh, ideally for sort of a, a UTMB. It's several one-kilometer hikes and descents. And it's the descents as well that are going to really give you some proper doms. Uh, so you 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 have to be careful doing this, but yeah, you you need to run down some sort of ideally one kilometer descents. And one of the best places to do that is is Snowdon, but but you know not not kind of on a on a sunny a sunny day at the weekend maybe. Um, it's quite a busy place, but that is one of the best mountains to do that on. Um, so I would do some of that uh, to condition your legs and and get used to the power hiking um, and yeah certainly recommend poles. So yeah, elevation becomes becomes a big thing nearer the, nearer the event I would say. And in the book on, I mean I don't know, I'm guessing this is a feature kind of earlier in your running career, but you seem to um, do quite a lot of events quite close together, shall we say, like an FKT a week before UTM or something like that. There was some, <laughs> maybe I've got the days wrong. I mean. Looking with those looking back, is that how you would train now, or were you just kind of making mistakes, <laughs> or is that a too strong a word? <laughs> well, if, again, to bring up Marcus, Marcus of course remembers very fondly when he when he coached me and almost sacked me. <laughs> um, I think he was. I think he wanted to sack me. Um, um, <laughs> seconds back, didn't I do a hundred miler about three or four weeks before? 
Dragon's Back, I think. Yes. Yeah, and you also yeah. added in a cheeky little half marathon <laughs> when you ran a PB and was and were quite you were quite kind of pleased with yourself for running a PB and maybe I wasn't joining in your uh, in your celebrations as much because it wasn't part of a training program. Um, but at least it kind of did show that base endurance, easy running, things was working. Difference uh, upon. Yes, and I must say, uh, yeah, Marcus did did really set me off well that year. It was one of my best years, and he brought me out of brought me out of injury and really set me up really nicely. Um, and I had yeah, really a really good year after that. So was, thank you, Marcus, and I'm sorry I was such a pain. Um, and actually, I only stopped working with Marcus, I should say, because in the book, I, d- I don't maybe don't make it clear. I worked with several coaches early on, but it was always just a short term thing because I had no money and couldn't really afford to pay them. So it was always a sort of a deal where I'd get them some magazine coverage in return. So I didn't want to, yeah, keep. When I the probably, goodwill probably, ran out, then you'd have yes, to probably, move probably, on. probably. So I didn't want to take the biscuit, although I probably did. Question again. Started losing um, my hair at the back, or sort of like that kind of. But it does seem well, that you've kind of your your race diary or your FKT diary isn't as full as it used to be a few years ago. Absolutely, yeah. No, um, I've, yeah, I've, yeah, I, 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 what is it? Sort of, yeah. I feel like a parent with some of my coaching clients, where you're trying to say, actually, you know, six races in a year isn't isn't sustainable, isn't such a smart idea. Um, you know, injury, burnout, or you just won't do as well as you can do in most of those races. Um, so yeah, I plan things a lot differently now. And early on, it was it was more about sort of they were more more almost stories for magazines, and so it was almost like um, I wasn't so bothered about my performances. But then as as my performances improved, I was just more and more excited about that, and I started sort of cancelling races, I suppose, and saying no to things to to become an athlete to try and do better in those races. Um, and yes, yeah, I think I ran around the Isle of Wight about ten days before my first UTMB, which again was I was thinking of <laughs> yeah. Which I, which I thought was, I say only only about sixty miles, but I hadn't really plotted it. It was it was actually well over seventy. Seventy four, uh, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised that UTMB went went so well. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm a lot smarter now, and and I um, uh, and it's a shame you've had to bring this up if any of my coaching clients are, are, are watching. Well, it's in the book. Um, it's in the book. It's there. <laughs> you true, you true, brought true. it up. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but essentially, as I'm sure you two would say as well, yeah, it, less tends to be more. Like now that I do, maybe maybe an ideal year would be like I suppose three big things, but even two, um, and and yeah, properly train for them, properly concentrate on them. Also, if you do all those things mentally, you're just you're not as excited about the next one. You're still tired from the last one. You, you know, you're more likely to not not do well or, or not complete it. Um, and, and just not as in, enjoy it. So, yeah, yeah, I've, wow. I've learned. It's, it sounds like all those years ago, you finally <laughs> listened to the advice I gave you at three races. So, um, but yeah. keeping with, with, with UTMB, you kind of talked about, you know, training for this. How, how important, because I know in your preparations that you spent quite a bit of time out in the Alps, playing on the course, playing around in those Alpine mountains. How, how important is it for something like UTMB or Tour de Gion or Lavaredo, those kind of big alpine um, races. It, how important would you say it is to get out in that kind of terrain and kind of just spend some time training on it? Or can we just in the UK spend time here and then go out and have a crack at them? Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, you, you, you probably will do better if you can get out there. But I think people could still do very well without doing that uh, I, I was top 10 in Lavaredo without without going out there um um UTMB I only once I suppose each year counted as a recce you could say but like um <laughs> and you're wrecking. Final year, right? <laughs> I was always wrecking for that final year um in that final year where I had my best result yes I wrecked it then maybe four weeks beforehand or five weeks um but actually I don't know it's debatable uh, it's it's I don't want to go get too too boring but like the year before my time wasn't actually all that different when I when I placed 12th the course was slightly different so it's difficult to be sure but there was probably only 20 or 30 minutes in it but I suppose at UTMB 20 or 30 minutes could be quite a lot of places mm. um yeah I mean you, you can do all right on British terrain what's interesting is say the altitude like I don't really feel it but say Beth Pascal for example she does so she she really you know she's you know uh, a proper runner so she goes out before and you know properly uh, you know climatizes for it um i don't seem to feel the altitude as such but you know some people do some people don't um but yeah you, if you can get out there you, you probably will do better um 
Excellent. Um, well, so uh, Leon Young, um, talking about other races coming up, um, wants to know if you're still doing UTS 50. Now it's in October. Talking yeah, about go, races, is this uh, Snowdonia. Oh, it's Taurus Snowdon. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I, I can't be sure. Um, I definitely want to do one of those races. They look fantastic. Um, Ultra Trail Snowdonia, that is. And yeah, they've got a they've got a hundred mile or a hundred k and a fifty k now. Mm. Um, and I really felt for for Mike Jones, the the RD, when last year, um, yeah, they were so close to being able to put it on, but um, it, you know they changed it and changed it, and yeah, really felt for him. But yeah, it just looks like. I mean, I love Snowdonia, and it just looks like a cracking race. Um, but I don't know, yeah, because if UTMB is on, then it's too close afterwards. But who knows if UTMB is on? So yeah, I'm going to keep that one, keep that one live if I can, and let's see. Ah, I was so you were due to do UTMB last year. I'm guess I've lost track of years now <laughs> from from COVID. Um, um, so what what's the plans with going back there? Is it to to very much kind of beat your time from before? Win or nothing. Win or nothing. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. I like it. I'm going to do a Zach Miller. Zach Miller on steroids. No, sorry, not on steroids. That's the wrong. Um, <laughs> Scoop here. <laughs> That's the wrong metaphor, isn't it? Um, I'm going to do a Zach Miller, uh, you know, do or die, all or nothing. Um, yeah. And yeah. Win, that win always broke. works. Because that, you know, it always the, works. What, oh. what happened was <laughs> the UTMB race many times, and even the uh, UTM fifth, that worked so much for all those guys. So, and... yeah, you'll be out by 100k then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ideally not that long. Ideally yeah, just 10, 10 k, because um, then I can go and do UTS fifty. So yeah, win. That, well, that's it. yeah, yeah. All, all the cool kids get pulled out at Cormier, and then we just get driven back through the tunnel. Um, <laughs> excellent. I, I don't. So um, Orange Goblins asked an interesting question, that, and um, I don't know if you actually have ever DNF'd in a race at all. Um, but Orange Goblin wants to know how difficult is the decision to pull out of a race if you get injured? Have you ever DNF'd in a race? No, not not in an ultra marathon. Um, no, I've never never. I've always been quite sort of lucky with. Well, I don't know if it's probably not luck, but in terms of yeah, I've always thought. Well, when I started off, the advantage I had was that they were nearly all magazine assignments early on, and I thought, well, I won't get paid. <laughs> it's not about the money, but it's like. I'll be away from my family for two or three days, four or five days, dragons back, you know, a week. Um, and like, if I come back with kind of nothing or come back early, like it's all been a waste for everyone. So I had to, and also sometimes there was a photographer employed as well. And I think they might have got paid, but maybe not. So like, I was always had this sense of, I've got to finish it because, you know, they've wasted their weekend as well. So I had quite a good incentives early on. Um, and then I think once you've completed the spine race, uh, yeah, like, nothing's been quite as hard as that first spine race, to be honest. So that's been a good, like I say to myself, is this as hard as the spine race? Well, no, you know, crack on. Um, so, but I would say, you know, a proper, you know, if you've got a proper injury, um, yeah, I, I've, I, you know, I've seen people, well, at the spine race actually have a, have an ankle problem early on and go, right, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish this and then have a problem for two years. So it's not always the smartest thing just to finish. Um, you know, if you know, think of your health and think of the long term. I don't think there should be, you know, much, much, much shame in that, especially if there's a, you know, a physical, a physical issue. Save yourself for another day. And in terms of your training, um, have you had any serious injuries, or is have you had any niggles? And if you haven't, how have you prevented that? Um, I've been very lucky the last few years. Um, but yeah, down the years, I yeah after the spine race that bashes you up quite a bit, and that's when when I went to see Marcus when I was having yeah tendon yeah some tendon damage. I think it was about six or seven weeks till I could run again. Uh, I've had a uh, I've had a bad ass, uh, a, gl- a glutus oh. glutus medius. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What's yeah. going on there? What, I is, think that's the story I, in the uh, book about the southwest coastal path van, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I was wondering where that was where that was going. I thought this was going to suddenly get excited. We're not past half past nine. We're not past one well, nine. Not, not past one. <laughs> and actually, yeah, the the so they were only quite fairly short lived. The biggest problem I've had was yeah, an Achilles, a, a tenacious Achilles issue for for uh, maybe yeah a few months. But I still I still did a few races on it, of course. But then ultimately, I had to stop for I suppose six weeks off is, is the longest I've had, which is which is yeah, I feel very lucky for that. Um, 
and why I, i'm not totally sure i guess i mean nowadays i do a fair bit of strength work i suppose regular massage yeah, running got, technique got like snoring. Got oh here. sorry sherlock <laughs> it's really boring he's snoring away <laughs> <laughs> what about the work because you um so you were one of i remember a couple of years ago kind of chatting about some bits with him but you mentioned shane benzie and kind of passing in conversation you've spent quite a lot of time working with with shane benzie being coached on your kind of the technique work how much do you think that's helped you as and keep away being injury free or prevented injuries i think it's definitely had an impact i think it would be one of five or six things i suppose that i that i do might do consistently or from time to time but but yeah when i first met him my you know i was running i was all over the place arms are everywhere massively overstriding um yeah i was doing everything everything wrong really uh i was an accident waiting to happen so so yeah if you pick up the mileage and you're running badly there's you know more i would say i don't know if it's actually you know strictly a study on it but but like you got a better chance of getting injured i think if you're if you're smashing into the ground and and beating yourselves up um so i think that's helped um yeah yeah but i think it's a combination of stuff i mean i don't yeah i very rarely drink alcohol for example um maybe i'd be a bit more exciting if i did maybe i'll actually have some jokes and stuff could, could, could have made this evening far more entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Could have, uh, a bit of effort yeah. and jeffing going on. Could have, you yeah. know. Uh, what about the strength? Could you, you, I need, you briefly touched about strength work there, and I know you've posted it on social media about the kind of strength work because you work with um, a coach in Bath, don't you, for your, co- your strength work. How integral a part is that? Is that something you do daily, kind of once a week, or how does that kind of... Yeah, um... Probably, I suppose, two to, two to four times a week of maybe sort of, usually it's just, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. I think it's it's a lot more realistic for people, including myself, if it's kind of a short, shorter burst rather than, you know, massive hour long things that you just keep putting off. And, and yeah, back to that question earlier, I, I have learned to like strength work to an extent now. But yeah, probably I'd even pick a, a, a an interval session over strength work, I suppose. <laughs> Ultimately, strength work is funny. <laughs> Shut up. Um, Gosh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've learned to learn to enjoy it, and I do feel the benefit of it in in several ways. So, and yeah, studies have shown it can benefit economy. Um, so, I think it's yeah, I'd say it's really worth worth doing. And, and is that working with a coach, or have you just kind of made your programs up yourself? And no, it's a bit of both. Yeah. So, uh, I'm actually going to see. Um, I'm pausing because I'm actually sort of working with a different guy now, uh, Co- oh. Coach D, um, who, who used to work for the same company. But yeah, I'm going to see him tomorrow, actually, um, now that gyms are opening. But actually, he does uh, weekly Zoom, sorry, d- almost daily Zoom classes. So I often do 30 minutes in the morning, uh, three times a week. Um, and also, I should mention Paul King at Team Bath Athletics Club, who does brilliant core strength um, online or during lockdown online classes, which are quite, quite grueling. Um, so yeah, combination of stuff. Right. Cool. And, and Leon Young has kind of jumped back in and said, um, actually he's, um, it's September, not October. I thought it was September, but gave I didn't. Off. So, so, <laughs> so he, so he realised he's, he's got one less month of training for ultra snow. So it's not, <laughs> not, not, good job. Good Sorry. job. He checked. Otherwise he would have been rocking up in October going, where is everybody? I've <laughs> been looking at social media going, hang on, why did they this race? Um, Rolling Man's asked quite an interesting question. I don't know, have you done a mountain marathon before? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, oh, I uh, pulled, pulled the, the wrong question up. Um, so everyone wants to know what you think is the, what is the physical and mental difference between a weekend mountain marathon and an ultra marathon? Yeah, so I've done, I've done OM, once oh, uh, know that uh, which one did you do the only one in the brecon beacons it was only a short score because my friend was injured um can i ask who the friend was that you were doing it with or who the victim was <laughs> uh, alex my friend alex copping from around here who i mentioned in the book um and we had that classic moment of of um both pointing the other going right where's the next score both pointing the opposite <laughs> way uh you know almost like a carry-on film and no, both being quite adamant that we were right <laughs> uh, i i was um <laughs> With your, na- with your top-notch navigation skills, of course. Absolutely. Um, yes, of all my running skills, uh, the yeah, the, the the worst is navigation. Um, dark, I've done dark mountains. The the January yeah. one goes through the night, which is which is quite well, yeah, really challenging. 
I did that with a good friend, Tim Laney, who's, um, who you guys will know, who's, uh, yeah, brilliant, very experienced at that sort of stuff. Uh, and actually, yeah, what, partly why I paused when you asked about DNFs, we didn't DNF, but we couldn't find one of the controls. So effectively, we were, I think, disqualified or, or whatever the terminology is there. So we didn't, you know, it wasn't a failure of spirit, but we couldn't find one at four o'clock in the morning in a whiteout. And we looked for about an hour and we're getting quite cold. So actually, it was it was probably safer just to move on and sort of give up. But that means effectively, well, yeah, effectively, we we're disqualified because we didn't complete it. Um, so, yeah, not very good at those. Uh, <laughs> I, I think because ultra running yeah you don't you sort of have to use your mind but really you can just turn it off and i'm probably not very clever really whereas mountain marathons you really do have to you know it's, it's cerebral uh you have to look at maps and do bearings and, and be quite clever uh and i'm not i'm not yeah not very clever so i think you fully admit that you gave all navigational tutors to beth in the cape wrath <laughs> <laughs> yes it it early on transpired she was sharper on that respect so she'd be like when's the next turning what how big's the next climb and i'd be like oh right uh <laughs> daydreaming i was just like oh wow look at these views so i just handed all the responsibility to her which did seem to um be a nice balance i had to carry a bit more but um that's i was gonna say out. a nice she, she seemed happier. <laughs> well she seemed happier because she wanted to know when i wasn't giving her the well, information she, yeah so, sometimes he's yeah, just she to know happier. you're not gonna get lost so let's do it yourself <laughs> Yeah, I think it worked out. I think so. Okay. We're, still, we're still talking. Excellent. So, yeah, mountain marathons are a lot more, aren't they? Well, it's orienteering. I call them orienteering on steroids in a mountain marathon. Cause they are... are you on steroids? Pardon? <laughs> Am I on steroids? No, no, mountain marathons are orienteering on steroids. Not. I don't mean mountain marathoners. I mean the events. <laughs> it's like the event themselves. Okay, right. careful, not, careful. Not, not, not those doing mountain. Now, I don't think you'd get many mountain marathoners doing steroids because well, they don't have to be a certain Well, it's the money that you get for those yeah, races. that kind of, you know, when I won the Kim, the trophy was phenomenal. Um, <laughs> and that Kim voucher was what everybody wanted that year. Um, <laughs> we're talking about UTMB earlier, um, about, about the race, and somebody did ask the question because there has recently been a bit of kind of news um about the utmb race itself and that it's kind of gone into partnership um mike ethington has asked a question um utmb iron man thoughts question going again question so i think we know we, we've already kind of if it's that you on are you going. will be going again but what's your thoughts so yeah do you want to explain can you explain what's happened there with utmb and iron man Yes, I can. So, yeah, I saw I saw the announcement um, a few days ago, like most people. And I don't know much about the triathlon world or Iron Man, but it seems most people don't have anything good to say about Iron Man. Um, so it's made people quite quite nervous uh, and worried, I suppose. Um, now, uh, yesterday, I think it was Ian Corliss asked me to go on his podcast and talk about it. So I thought, oh, b bugger, I better sort of try and find out, you know, try and actually understand what all this is about. So I actually spoke to someone um, quite senior at UTMB and also a, a race director in the UK to get their perspective. Um, so, and, and I guess the headline, uh, or, or at least the summary is, it doesn't seem as bad as maybe it sounded, I think. But my big, my first concern was, is this encouraged? So the whole setup about qualifying has changed as well, but maybe not as much as it sounds. But I was worried it would like encourage a lot more flights, I suppose, and a lot more travel. Um, and probably the biggest footprint in running is our travel to international events anyway, if you fly. Um, uh, so, but what you do now, yeah, you can still qualify inside the UK. You, you, you'll do a qualifier race, just like a UTMB points race, but you only need to do one. And that, that sort of gets you on the system. That kind of starts you off. And it could even be a 20K or 50K or something. It doesn't have to be huge. Um, then you do need to do, um, there'll be one like UTMB event in, in, in our country to start with, but they're looking into a second one and maybe even more. And there'll be, I think 30 of them around the world and they will try and concentrate them on the areas that go to UTMB. So Britain has a huge amount of people at UTMB. I think we're may, maybe the third or fourth most popular sort of nationality there. So they'll try and give us good events in, in Britain. Um, one, one should be ready next year at least. Um, and you'll need to do that complete that but there are various distances 
Um, complete that, you get a stone or several stones, and, and then you can go straight into the, the ballot. So in a way, that's quicker than it used to be, where for a lot of people, it'd be two, three, four years. And now, obviously, the more stones you get, the better chance you have in the ballot, like at Western States. So you might want to do more races or you might want to do longer distances, but you don't sort of have to. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And it might be that the congestion of people happens at a domestic level trying to get into this at the moment one UK race. That might be the problem now. And there's more congestion there and less congestion at the UTMB end. But hopefully that will thin out um, as more events come. My next one. Yeah. So it's the environmental thing. And is it still really accessible to, to your everyday runner? Um, it sounds like they're going to be OK. And then the third re reservation for a lot of us was, you know, the Ironman thing. And John Kelly was who know, you know, he's done lots of Ironmans, um, was quite outspoken on Twitter saying it's, you know, uh, I don't want to misquote him. But, you know, he wasn't in favour um, of the organisation. Um, now, I've chatted. Uh, yeah, to, to this this person at UTMB and they said, you know, there's no plans to hike the prices. Um, you wouldn't see any Ironman branding at UTMB. You know, they they appreciate that the, the values of trail running are very different to triathlon. They're not going to try and, uh, you know, uh, rip everyone off and, and stuff. So I felt encouraged, but I suppose, you know, I'm trying not to be too naive. I mean, um, let's see what happens, I suppose. But um, and also what was really interesting is they they hinted that. So Ironman has already bought three big races around the world. They already owned Tarawera in New Zealand. Ultra Trail Australia, and then they just bought Mozart 100, which me and Marcus have done, and, and you've been out there videoing people dancing at. Um, <laughs> so they were already compiling a list, you know, uh, not a list, sorry, a collection of races. And UTMB, they hinted that, like, if they didn't get involved with them, UT Ironman would have like a rival circuit, which I guess might not have mattered to us. We might have just ignored them. I don't know. But you've also got Sparta coming in last a year or two ago as well taking some of the race like Lavaredo and forming their own circuit. So you've got, I think it's, you know, the secret about trail running is probably out and, and big commercial bodies are, you know, trying to get in on it. And, um, you know, maybe this is for the better. And also, but also we shouldn't take, I mean, UTMB is, is fine. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll they reassured me that, you know, you know, they make plenty of money. They're not, they're not going anywhere, but like Ronda del Sims disappeared last year. And that was a race, a uh, big hundred miler in, in um, Andorra that I wanted to do some time. I just thought it would always be there and it's gone. Um, so, yeah, we might be in a new era now where I suppose more money is coming in, but maybe it'll preserve some races. Maybe some things will change, but we'll see. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, I mean, it was just a really interesting, I mean, uh, also I, in some respects, because of the uncertainty we've had of not having races on during COVID, and then in some respect, we were all expecting just to get back into usual races. And then this is suddenly announced. It almost throws a curveball into what, you know, we perceive we'd just be getting back into some of the, you know, this organization like Ironman, which, as you say, is for a lot of trail runners and ultra runners is perceived to kind of, you know, not I wouldn't say snootily, but, um, but you know, it, it doesn't have the same reputation, it feels at times, as somebody like some trail races, which are very low key and aren't there to make lots of money. And it was almost a bit of a worry that this big corporate organization was going to come in and change a lot of the ethos of our very simple, basic sport almost. Yeah, I mean, but UTMB almost sits in the middle of those two things, doesn't it? Where some people already see UTMB as, as not really, you know, it's very different to the fell running world, for example. Um, and yeah, people are quick to quick to say, oh, I could do this fell race for £2.26 uh, and UTMB costs, I think it's 280 80 euros, which actually I think is still decent value. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not a spokesman for the for the race, and there are things about it I don't like, but but <laughs> actually from the experience you get out there, it's it's pretty good. Um, so UTMB sits in the middle. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting. I, I, yeah, I can't predict how it's going to go, but we'll see. I suppose. I mean, it might be that. UTMB, I think, have had trouble trying to set up a race in America or, or to or to link in the American side of things. It might be that they get Ironman to take care of that or do stuff over there. And, and uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows how that will go? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it must have been a horrible time for race organizers. Yeah, we mentioned Michael Jones earlier, the organizer of Ultra Snowden. 
and had a few chats with me. You know, it's been a really difficult year. You know, it's for some of us who are coaches, it's you know, it's it's we've still been able to get work coming in, but for people who are race organisers who have st- set up their businesses, organisers races like Shamey Shane only at Aria events for Dragons Back and Kate Rath. Um, you know, we've got to be mindful that those people have had a real difficult time over the last 12 months of not having events on. Um, so I think they've got to be creative in some respects, haven't they? And think about ways of, of keeping their business coming in. Yes. Yes, it must have been very, yeah, really horrible. So um, I think, yeah, and, and, and like I say, with Ronda Del Sims disappearing, it shows you that, yeah, we can't guarantee these events will be around. So, so we got to, I suppose we've got to support them either we've got to support them or, or they might need to look for other ways to, you know, keep them sustainable. So, um, yeah, but I guess, yeah, with UTMB, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Are mm-hmm. there any um, races that are on your bucket list that must do for you that you haven't done already? Uh, yeah, I do. I do want to do the Tour de Gion. I think that's, that's been calling me for a while. I just keep, keep signing up for UTMB by mistake or <laughs> out of habit. Um, but yeah, Tour de Gion, I, I, I would, yeah, I'll try hard to get into that next year. I think I've been, I've been wanting that one. And yeah, I mean, there are some races in America that, that interest me, but they're all, yeah, they're so difficult to get into. Mm. And of course there's a, you know, a big flight. So that's, that's something I'm being more conscious of now. Um, and weighing that up, but yeah, Tour de Gion, I think. You guys fancy that one? Oh yeah, definitely. But as you said, there's so many, so many races out there trying to, pick and choose and, and how you, you know and, and you, you kind of alluded there about the kind of flying and again in the last kind of sorry about Sherlock snoring and <laughs> crumbling in the background um in the last couple of years you, you've kind of got this bit of a persona of being a kind of can I, can I say eco warrior is, is, that, is, that, is that is that still a thing but somebody who's passionate about our environment um how much does that now have an influence the races or events that you're thinking about doing? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, I, I guess I, I, I suppose I'm aware it, um, it's there's a there's a contradiction in what I'm doing, and and to some people I'll, I'll seem like a hypocrite in that I might fly sometimes. It's been it's been it's been quite nice not you know not being able to fly for a long time, um, and uh, yeah, and I represent the sports brand and and. You know, fa- the fashion industry is a, is a huge issue, a huge polluter. In fact, um, fashion industry is is worse than aviation overall. Um, so, but I'm I'm just trying to be more, yeah, a lot more responsible, I suppose, with those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, it, I, it's really changed, I suppose. I think to it's in, in the book. I think two or three years ago, yeah, I realised I'd flown six or maybe seven times in a year. Including, I mean, one was a family holiday, but it was still, you know, I wasn't really aware of how much of a footprint that was creating and, and then when I looked into it I was quite horrified really and, and thought I can't I can't sort of continue to do that so um yeah I, I wouldn't say I've given up flying altogether it, it, you know if an amazing race you know if there's an amazing race or you know if I can get to one of these races in America but that would almost definitely be the only flight of the year and you know I'd offset it and so on but and, and I've made other lifestyle you know copied you guys and gone gone vegan and um um, the other big change most people can make is is changing the energy in their houses uh, to a renewable energy supply, which you can do in like five minutes online. Um, but yeah, so I mean, there's a big debate to be had. Like, there's personal changes and there's political changes, and obviously the polit- political stuff can have so much more impact. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not. Uh, how do I say this? Yeah, I'm not trying to tell anyone else what to do, and I haven't really done much myself, to be honest. Um, but I, I think it's the political stuff to really think about. Um, uh, whether that's protesting or, or joining in even online campaigns, but also voting, you know, voting for, for unfortunately, we don't have a, a big election for a while here, but, you know, voting for people who care about the planet um, because we're really, um, yeah, at risk of getting all serious. We're really, really desperately running out of time. We met, we, scientists say we need to cut 45% of global emissions by the end of this this decade, you know, so it, we need dramatic changes. Um, and all that's, all that's, yeah, got me quite stressed out. Um I'm trying to think of a, uh, a a light-hearted way to end this round. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> had you, I'm had not you really... always been that kind of conscious about your kind of carbon footprint, or was this was it almost a bit like a midlife crisis? All of these some of the things happening and reading some articles. Like, um, I forgot this thing about. No, I was. Well, 
yes and no. I mean, I grew up with, uh, I don't know, sort of fairly classic hippie parents. You know, they voted green for decades. And my sister's been in Extinction Rebellion for a while, you know, lives in Bristol. I think it's mandatory there. Um, uh, so I guess I've come from that sort of background. I, and I went to school in Stroud where Extinction Rebellion were formed. Um, so I guess it's that sort of background. But then like a lot of people, I sort of had climate change fatigue where you just see all the headlines all the time and just think, oh, yeah, yeah, we know the Arctic's melting. We know we haven't got any bees left. We know we've got no flat, you know, no no insects anymore. But, you know, someone will sort it out. Uh, and then you kind of go, hold on, <laughs> no one's sorting it out. This is a bit frightening now. Um, so it was, yeah, more of a midlife crisis moment, but a sort of, I suppose, a background of, of, of that sort of, um, those sorts of values, but then uh, a midlife crisis moment almost to, to compound my other midlife crisis moments. Which- <laughs> I mean, there's a few we can name for you. <laughs> <laughs> and discovering running in the first place. Um Yes. Yeah. It's more in the last couple of years where I've really, I, well, I genuinely feel stressed and anxious about about it and the fact that, you know, so many things aren't happening that need to happen. Um, yes. Yes. Not sure. Again, struggling for a light heart. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do, the average runner, as um, kind of thinking about tips for us for being conscious about the environment in terms of picking races and things like that? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, it looks like, and I am, I'm very lucky, I'm probably, well, I'm working on a second book for Vertebrate, and it is about sort of sustainability and running. I think for most runners, our biggest footprint will be from traveling to to events, or at least ultra runners, pay, or people who go abroad, I suppose. But I don't think anyone should say, oh, you can't fly anymore. I don't think that seems quite fair. But I think it's, consider how, you know, how many times, you know, is is right for you to fly, consider whether that's kind of, fair consider whether you can make other adjustments in your life so yeah again the big the big two other ones are your diet um and and the energy for you know your your house usually which is a really quick one and, and eating eating plants is is fun and much easier than i than i realized uh, well I've, I've always eaten plants but like um yeah giving up giving up meat and dairy is um actually really easy and fun um uh and uh, yeah w- i love i love what dan lawson and charlotte his his wife are doing with rerun clothing and and they're concentrating on um, yeah, T-shirts, effectively. So running has a T-shirt problem. And as I said earlier, fashion, the fashion industry is a huge, huge polluter and makes, you know, so much unnecessary clothing that, that takes a long, you know, there's a lot of water and carbon emissions involved in creating it. And then often they're in a landfill and, and that's releasing methane as, as they rot and, and, you know, taking decades to biodegrade. Um, a lot of our tops, you know, a technical top is effectively plastic. Um, so if we can, st- you know, and so many races give us free t-shirts that often we don't don't really need or want um so if we can start politely saying no to no to races this is the message from rerun clothing just just politely say no to a race but even better if you if if races race is can sign up to uh trees not teas then it gives people the option they can they can plant a tree instead with with jim mann's uh jim mann's company who's a record-breaking fell runner fell runner uh marcus will know well from from racing him um and and me uh um so that that's yeah there's some things to think about there hopefully Hopefully yeah no they're good and I was also like one of the things that you highlighted was about like even just the packaging of uh running bars and what we're taking out on a run and thinking about that because that's something that we can easily change yeah now I must admit I'm that that's a lot of these areas are very complicated and this one is complicated because for example if I don't know if I bought if I bought a, a locally made bar that had a bit of plastic on, or if I stopped for a while. So last year I tried to do all my big challenges without any plastic waste. So I didn't buy bars in plastic or any, or even crisps in plastic or bottles in plastic. Um, but actually sometimes I might buy an avocado, um, which, you know, is sometimes available without plastic. And that might've come, you know, from Mexico. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that deliberately as such, but like that might've actually had a bigger carbon footprint. So I, I must be honest, I'm still sort of, still working out <laughs> all of that of how like how do we eat you know responsibly you know we back live sorry hello we're back sorry we just lost how. our internet there um i think maybe, i got maybe, maybe the government was tuning uh, in and they were getting a bit concerned <laughs> that we were getting a bit kind of radicalizing bit us yeah and they like took our internet down quickly um <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you're saying, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, about packaging and stuff. And like you say, yeah, avocados and almond milk and stuff like that. When you look in the carbon footprint of them, 
you're thinking in chickpeas as well you're thinking great it's gonna be a really good environment but yeah if they're coming all the way from mexico um or other parts of europe and kind of transportation it is yeah it does become a really interesting one doesn't it it's kind of a really yeah so i'm still worm. i'm still trying to work all that out if i'm honest but yeah one thing pebble you at least we can think of our plastic our plastic consumption there's a really really good book called um how bad are bananas by mike berners lee which goes through lots of individual things in your life even like reading an email how much emissions would that have released um and the good thing is bananas aren't that bad by the way um <laughs> they've traveled a long way um it doesn't they haven't necessarily been air freighted so um yeah it's not that straightforward but but plastic yeah plastic is is pretty bad and is ending up just everywhere it's quite frightening so yeah that is something people could you know if we can cut down on our plastic but but so i suppose just sometimes something locally that is in a bit of plastic that might last a bit longer isn't necessarily worse but yeah it's complicated but i think that the message that you put across is just kind of do your best like even if we yeah. can solve this and be perfect did you or is it somebody else that used the hashtag like imperfectly green or something like that just... yes we're in perfect activism because yeah aiming for perfection like none of us are going to get there no one's morally perfect so just being a bit better or progression not perfection yeah. don't be afraid to I suppose don't be afraid to, you know, just improve a bit and, and don't worry that you're not perfect because um, I'm certainly not. But, you know, I'm trying. Um, so, I'm yeah. Sure I we'll all call you out on that on social media. <laughs> <laughs> you claim well, that you're perfect. You're like, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry. You put yourself up for that at the but, moment. But, 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 but even, though, even though you're putting yourself up there, I mean, but it, it is good to be reminded, isn't it, about our impact upon the environment? Because like we're saying about UTMB going into partnership with Ironman, you know, we claim our sport is this wonderful being con in con connected with the environment and being in the outdoors and is quite, in some respects, almost like a, a, an experience. But then we are having an impact upon that environment by our rubbish or by the stuff, the kit we're buying and how many, you know, we're always getting the new bits of kit. But I think, yeah, it's, it's good that we are being prompted and being kind of reminded, actually, that sometimes wanting the latest piece of kit it, it does does have an environment impact and our current running pack might actually still be working completely fine yes and uh that's something i've been working on i mean i'm i'm no different to anyone else when you when you see the new version it's tempting to think i need the new version uh and often often your current version is is just fine uh, um and, and yeah the most sustainable kit is the kit you've got now uh, and we're certainly, I think most of us are, are guilty of over consuming, like to, to, you know, having too many things, whether that's running stuff or not. Um, and, and they all have an em emissions associated and then, and then they often end up, yeah, creating more emissions when they're sort of disposed of. So yeah, we can all be a bit better. I, again, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to be better at that, you know, repairing things, reusing, refusing even with the t-shirts um, mm. uh, and trying not to, yeah. Still using. I'm trying to trying to see if I've got an example around here. I did did post one or two on Instagram the other the other week, uh, but they weren't they weren't that impressive. It was yeah, some gloves with a, ho a hole in and. A... Oh, you need to get some better socks. You need to get socks like in gingy socks, which don't get holes in. Personally, I would. Are you sponsored by in gingy Um Well, it might well be actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I must say, I when I, in the past when I've used in gingy socks, they've been good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm. Also happy with my Innovate socks. Uh, they, they look like they're your, Sunday, they're, they're your Sunday best ones, weren't they? Your your holy ones. There you go. You can you can have that dad oh, joke dad for jokes. Have it's that one. The that dad your, dad your ten year old will <laughs> will love that one. Um, my sixteen year old got me with one of my brilliant dad jokes every week in a, in, in a shop looking at camouflage stuff. But I'll tell you about that one later. <laughs> uh, all the years of all hard year, you know, those years of trying to get dad jokes across actually finally paid off and did a blinder. Anyway, Dave, we, we have been chatting for over uh, an hour and yeah. meant to be on till sorry, we still haven't got to a lot of questions. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am. But I think we kind of covered lots. <laughs> all right I, I mean i could do a very quick few if you want but um There's yeah, one about, um, about i think the ones that we missed was one about how you motivated yourself during lockdown oh maybe this is to maybe they're worried about us getting another lockdown <laughs> um i found it really um yeah motivating because you didn't have anything imminent so actually you just i just went running for the for the joy of it really it sounds a bit a bit wishy-washy and hippie but but <laughs> i just felt the pressure kind of lift a bit and just go and run and explore so that 
I almost re, re you know re fell in love with running actually I, I hope I hope other people felt the same um but yeah I still had some, yeah still had some down days as well like, like we've, actually, we've actually got a question for Marcus <laughs> did <laughs> Damien have any unusual quirks as an athlete when you coached him <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, I think we should end the show here. Uh, <laughs> Suddenly you haven't time. got Sorry. time for any more questions. <laughs> oh, that's quite good. I think we've, um, we've uh, maybe have to wait taken for my apart Damo's <laughs> <laughs> approach as a coached athlete for enough tonight. Um, the other <laughs> final question was about your plans for this year. So we've got a secret thing that we're not talking about. And you've mentioned UTMB. Is there anything else coming up this year for you? At the moment, they're the they're the two things. But I would I would definitely like to do yeah at least one other thing. But it's just yeah what and 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 when. So I'm not totally sure. Um, yeah, at the moment they're my two big things. But hopefully um, one more thing. What about a um a certain little spine race come winter? Is that is that a possibility? I mean, if you start posting photos of sleeping bags around December, which I think you did the other year, I mean, it can only mean one thing. <laughs> I uh, I might be tempted. I might tempted. be tempted. Somebody's yeah. just mentioned the Barclays. Is that a is that a temptation for you? It is tempting. Yeah, it is tempting. But it's well, uh, I can't find the website. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go. It's taken over by Iron Man. I think that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they get you into America. Going straight in for the Barclays. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, then we know the sport's a bit doomed. <laughs> fantastic brilliant brilliant so if people want to get hold of your new book in for the long run how can they get hold of a copy because that's what you're meant to be here talking about <laughs> we have talked about so much other stuff you'll be chucking yours out well i'll just go to the nearest bargain bin of your, your nearest bookshop uh yeah no uh it's better to buy it if possible from the vertebrate website uh it's 20 percent off there so it's the same price as amazon um, I think the Vertebrate website is V hyphen publishing. Uh, but if you just uh, search Vertebrate publishing, um, yeah, very, feel very grateful for the reception it's had and for the amount of people who have um, bought it. And I hope they don't regret it too badly. But thank you very much. We got ours for free, so we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Well, we'll, we'll put a link down below um, on the YouTube channel and on the podcast yes. show notes so that we'll put a link to the vertebra so people can head over to vertebra to buy a copy rather than and lots of other amazing running books that they have and if people are interested in hiring you as a coach are you still taking athletes on are you still doing lots of coaching if i'm honest i'm 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 at capacity at the moment but um yeah try try marcus or jenny they you know i'm i'm at slightly capacity as well so um (laughs) it's it's been an interesting year for how coaching has kind of blossomed during lockdown in some respects uh, well, yeah, uh, if you like, uh, maybe later in the year or, or something, or at least I can direct you to some other good coaches. Um, you can find me on Instagram quite easily, hopefully. I was going to say. Um, but yeah. Yeah, we'll... We'll put your social media <laughs> bits on there so people can find you and get in touch with you and be inspired on how they can make a bit less of a carbon impact and change their carbon footprint as well. Or maybe just have a little look at some photos and do detective work of what your next plan is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you if yeah. you recognise those lumps, <laughs> <laughs> recognise those hills, recognise those paps. It might be Albert uh, two out two. Might be five. Brilliant, Damien. Well, thank you so much. Good luck with everything much. this year. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, good luck for UTMB. We look forward to seeing you out there smashing it, full on, going for it, <laughs> really hard, and uh, Zach Millering it. Zach yep. Millering it. Yeah, and good luck. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me on, and yeah, catch up soon. Yeah, yeah we'll catch you soon. Take, Take it care, easy. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Oh, fantastic. Well, there we go to Mr. Damien Hall. Um, and uh, there we go. Wonderful. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this evening's chat with Damien. And um, if you kind of got any more comments of what we've been talking about, please post them below. If you've been following us on YouTube and watching us on YouTube, Click subscribe to keep up to date with what's going on. And if you've been listening to us on the podcast and you've enjoyed it, then please leave us a review. It kind of helps our ratings. And uh, yeah, I think that's all the admin bits and pieces done. Next week, I think Claire's 
back. Yeah. Maybe at half past six. Sure. We know time. we have enough information um, to do anything. Yeah, I'm lucky to have a piece of paper. I'll get reading reports out. Don't ask me who's um, on in two weeks. And then we're, we're, we're back on in two weeks, and uh, we have a mystery guest. <laughs> um, so yeah, keep. You're, again, this is why it's so important to subscribe to the channel because you will get um, uh, a kind of a link to who we've got in two weeks time. So hopefully you can join us in two weeks time. Uh, stay safe. Enjoy the running you've been doing. If you've enjoyed it, kind of say click on subscribe and uh, keep in touch. Take Bye -bye. care. Goodbye.